Right, we'll be talking about health. <coughs> Our work as developers is not really dangerous, right? We sit in a comfortable environment. Nobody's trying to kill us, usually. Uh, but as years turn into decades, it takes its toll. Uh, wrists got worn out. There's some spine issues. You have eyesight problems after a while. Uh, and there is stress. Uh, risks are a bit separate topics, so we'll tackle them first. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, stress. There are many causes, causes of stress. There are internet connections going down, failing hardware, using Windows, plenty, plenty of issues. Uh, tight deadlines. We can't help much with that. Uh, but there is another kind of stress, uh, which is caused by using tools in a wrong way. For example, if you have a hammer and nail, use a hammer. This is the right tool for a job, right? But normally, you hammer the nail with the flat side of the hammer, right? You can, of course, hammer it with the thin side. And this is, this tool, this is still the right tool for the job. But you are using it the wrong way. Uh, so those three, spine, eyes, and stress, they are actually co tightly connected. We will see pre presently why. Uh, it all boils down to efficient use of resources. Uh, when I started digging into that, I asked myself the question, does it really matter uh, which style of programming do we use? Um, after a while, it turned out, maybe. Maybe the, the starting point was, is our brain better suited for one or the other programming style? And I did some research and I came to some conclusions, which I now have a privilege and pleasure to share, share with you. We'll start with wrists because this is the, the most simple thing. Uh, wrists are worn out because of typing, right? So unless you have one of those outrageously expensive ergonomic keyboards, then after a while you, trust me, you will have problems. Uh, by the way, if you are using mouse, consider a trackball because if you're using a mouse, you do a lot of this. And, the, and after a few years, it begins to hurt. So, but this is sign not. The, Wrists got worn out because of typing. So we want to type less, right? Uh, does functional programming mean less typing? Uh, there is no scientific proof for that because there, it's mm, nearly impossible to prove it experimentally. There are statistics uh, which, shows, which show that uh, functional code is between two to ten times shorter. So it's not really precise information, but it. Uh, it means something. Uh, I found this interesting. Th this is a list of implementation of QuickCheck and the best implementations chosen by the QuickCheck authors uh, in every, of the, every language. And this is thousands of lines, so <coughs> you can pretty much tell the difference uh, between 6 and 77, uh, and you can, pretty much, you can hear what's on the top. So, check. Less typing, good for us, we score one point. Um, then, the, mo the main point. We want to make our work easier. easier. Uh, we want to use our brain in the way that it's meant to be used, in the right way, so, this is, so it's efficient and productive. Uh, what are we best at as human beings? What is, what is the operation that we do in our brain that is most efficient? Uh, it's you know, like a bitwise operations in, in computing. The fastest possible thing. What is it? Anybody knows? It's this. Uh, it's um, recognizing familiar and familiar patterns and flows in those patterns. And this is because for a million of years our life depended on it. Uh, Bartosz Milewski likes to say that we are made, we are built for hunting mammoths, not for solving equations. And this is a grain of truth in him because it's like you see a green field, grass, and you see oh, an animal was passing by, right? Or you search for fruit, or you see you, 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 so there's a danger in the bush. You, can, you don't see the tiger, there's a tiger, right? But you see something moved, something is wrong. And this is what our brain is optimized for. Um, just to give an example, what's wrong with this picture? Um, Sorry. Yeah. How long did it take you? Half a second? 
maybe. And look how much work you have done. You, you started looking at it, you formulated the pattern after like two tenths of a second probably, then you scan the rest and you find the, the, wrong, the, the wrong place. So this is how efficient we are. Uh, this is something every experienced driver um, knows. When you drive in a he heavy traffic and all cars are following a certain pattern, and then you spot a car that swerved an inch or did something wrong. You don't know what, but you say, oh, there's something wrong with it. So this, this is our, um, our optimization. Um, now to the point. Why am I talking about pattern recognition? There are two pieces of code. This one is in Python, this one is in Erlang. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't actually mean that much in what language it is written, because you can write crappy code in every language, and you can, you can, you can write good code in JavaScript or whatever. But the, the functional programming like enhances and sometimes it forces certain good practices. For example, those two pieces of code, they do the same thing. They, act, they take three input variables, and they, they, they do some logical conclusions. Check me out. Now, try to figure out what this code does. If you want, for example, what this code would do if you have bad false and ugly false. Then you have a number of clauses, and you have, you have to read them line by line. And see, because there's always, there's always two of them. One, is, one of them is missing. So you have to read all those lines a few times, probably, uh, until you figure out what are you looking for. Now, if you try to do the same here, you don't have to read it at all. You just do a quick scan. Here. Done. So, in my opinion, pattern matching is the most readable construct ever invented in, uh, in uh, programming. So, oh, sorry. Check. Um, there are a few other interesting things about pattern recognition. Uh, for example, in chess. Uh, chess is in a way about strategic planning, about thinking ahead, what your, your, what your opponent is supposed to, is expected to do. But not, all, not only. Have you ever seen chess players playing Blitz? Blitz is a chess game which has a very short time limit, like two minutes. So there's no, way, there's no time for thinking. Those guys are moving the figures like, as, as fast as their hands could go. They, they, are not, they, do, they do not think at all, because there's no time for it. Uh, they recognize patterns on chessboard and make decisions based on, the, on it. And this is actually called recognition prime decisions. Uh, yeah, because their heads are full of patterns, like ready to use, they, all don't, they, they only have too much. So it's done instantly without thinking. Uh, this another kind of recognition prime decisions which are based on episodic patterns. Uh, episodic, pa episodic memory is memory of something you've experienced. Not something you've read or seen or heard, but something you, you actually have been through. You, you took part in it. And some, some call it experience. And uh, this is something that is very annoying about senior people in every workplace. Uh, because it's, so, it's very frustrating for juniors when they come up with an idea and the senior guy said, no, it's not going to work. That's like this, after a split second. How on earth does he know it? He didn't even think about it. Well, no. But he has, he sp having spent decades on a job, uh, he has uh, lots of patterns in his episodic memory. And he just do quick match. Yes, I've seen it. Go away. Um, yeah, back to the topic. Because I diverted, sorry. I diverted a little bit. Um, we want to save our spine. We want to um, have a right posture when we are working. How can functional programming help with that? Let's see. Uh, this is how we should sit at work. There's eight strict requirements which should all be followed. Frankly, who does that? I can spend about, when I try, I spend about 20 seconds in this position. Then inevitable, like pretty much everybody does, something like this. <laughs> this is common typing position for the software developer, which is actually horrible from orthopedic point of view, 
because it kills the spine here. So if you keep doing this for several years, you end up wearing like something like this, like stiff collar. And uh, if we read the code, which is we also do, which we actually spend more time reading than writing, right? Uh, we often do something like this, which is even worse. Um, okay, so what would you like to do? What is the good for our position for our health? Well, a good position is when we are thinking about code. And do something like this, right? Spine is straight, we are relaxed, we are not stressed out, we are thinking. Uh, someone else gets stressed out, it means our managers. Because most of them, with some notable exceptions, cannot for the life of them understand that this is where we do our work. This is when we are the most productive, right? It's the most important moment in our daily job. To think about stuff, not just... Okay, but we cannot help with that. The managers have to manage their stress levels themselves. Um, where was I? Yeah. So our goal is to spend as much time as possible in this posture, right? Okay, let's see. Right. As I said, we, do, we spend mo mo more time reading than writing. And we have to understand the code. So now, what does it mean to understand anything? To understand means to build a, the psychologists call it concept network. It is a mental model which we have inside our heads, which is built of concepts and relations. So for example, this is a concept network uh, that a two-year-old kid could build around the concept of a car. So car, there's fuel that goes into a car, car does room and carries people somewhere else. And that's, having figured out this much, the kid can pretty much say it knows what car is all about. Uh, but now then, then the kid can start thinking about it. So, for example, without any further input, any, any more observations, he already knows that fuel is going to a car. Okay, I guess the cars need the fuel, right? Because that is fuel in the car all over and over again. So the fuel doesn't need to be there. It has to be, it is used by the car. So our kid did some thinking and extended its concept network by one more relation. And that's actually what thinking is. It is building, rebuilding the concept network, creating new concepts, creating new relations, destroying relations or concepts which proved to be, which, which we found, found out to be wrong. Um, right ho. Where do concepts come from? Well, we have a stream of input, and some of the input turns into concept. We have to isolate the concept and store it. We'll start with storage. Um, we have our memory is built of two layers. I mean, it, it doesn't mean it physically built like this because we, we don't know how it is wired inside. But it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it works as if it was built physically like that. And this is good enough for our purpose. Uh, there's a working memory which is sort of like an input buffer. Everything that goes into our head goes to work in memory. Uh, so it is very high throughput. It's very small. I mean, uh, there's a lot of experiments. Uh, to figure out how big or how small a working memory is, and it's estimated to be like between five to ten digits. So this is really tiny. That's how much we can hold in our head, like uh, random information. And stress and alcohol seriously impair working memory, by the way. Uh, and there's associative memory, which is not that efficient, but it's persistent and it's a huge capacity, uh, like nearly infinite. Uh, it's like uh, many people can run, it's like running. Many people can run uh, one mile. There are people who, ride, who run marathons. There are people who run ultra marathons, like 100 miles. But we know that nobody ever will run 1,000 miles at one go. This is not the case with memory. There is no known limit to it. So uh, actually there's no, nothing that would prevent someone from memorizing complete works of William Shakespeare, for example. Um, Right. Right. So this is the picture that would illustrate. There's a lot of input coming in. Like you hear me talking, you check something on your smartphone, you feel that the seat is hot, you smell coffee, whatever. Everything goes to work in memory, and nearly everything is immediately flashed to the null. It just goes away. Unless we pick up something that we 
care about. And we build an association, and it gets flushed to associative memory. And it stays there for a long time, sometimes forever. A good association is something that is familiar and that is, triggers some emotions. Well, for example, if I tell you 75, pff, it's just a random number. It's nothing. Uh, but if you happen to know that this was actually the bore of the main gun of a Sherman tank, then this is something. And it surprised you, so it triggers some emotions. And you can remember it. And probably next year, if you go to Lambda Days and uh, someone mentions my talk, chances are the only thing you will remember will be 75. Um, it's like um, another story about memories, like trying to memorize a phone number. Like you are somewhere, uh, you meet someone you would, you would like to meet again, and upon, par upon leaving, uh, you ask, could you give me my phone, your phone number? And yes, it's 6875838861. Call me late, call, call me tomorrow, bye. Uh, and then there you are, Frantic is trying to repeat the number all over and over again to memorize it, but it's nine digits. Yeah? It's just about the size of your working memory. And there's any distraction, gone. So much for the romance. Uh, but if you think about it like this, 68 Woodstock Festival. 75 is the number that Dude of Lambda Days was talking about. Then you have a snowman on the Sherman tank. Then you have an old computer. And then we have a pipe to flush it all to work in memory, to associative memory. What was the phone number again? I, I bet half of you could, could, could recall it now. Uh, so, we have a stream of input. Uh, again, and you have one digit, which, is, which means nothing. You have another, which means nothing. You have another. This is something. This is an P my first PC when I have trouble installing Civilization 5 or whatever. This is concept. There, has, there is association. Bang. There it is. So this is how all the mnemotechnics are built. Are built. Um, now, why am, I, why am I talking about it? This is our reading code, revisited. This is another example. Uh, this is Python again. This is all come this time. And this again, the other two pieces of code, they do the same thing. But what actually is this code doing? If you try to figure out, it's purely imperative. It reads something from a file, starts an array, it does something to some part of it, uh, this catches an exception, changes into an integer, appends to something, then it's appends to something else, and so on, and so on, and so on. You are trying to understand what this code does. So you are trying to stitch together some concepts so that you can store them, right? But it's not easy, because there's like a dozen lines, so it's, it's bigger than your working memory. So there you are, frantically trying to jump in up and down your eyes, trying to put it together. It's not easy. You get stressed out. You, you waste time, you lose your health. Now look at this. What does this code do? Well, it opens file false lines by executing parse row. Check. Then, parsing row means filtering a string and mapping something on it. Right. What? We are turning it into integers. Right. How do we make an integer? Well, if it's, some, if it's empty, then it's none. If it's something, then it's something. Okay. What is it? It's a concept network. So the point is that here you have to stitch those elements together to, put, to, to build a concept network. Well, here it's ready. It's already laid out for you in the code. There's nothing more to do. Uh, so you, you have all the concepts. You have association between them. You have them stored. My point is that uh, functional programming is explicit about concepts. Uh, and I would go even further, and I would say that while well, imperative code is organized by operation, then functional programming is organized by concept, which means it's, it's, it's way easier to understand. Now, we read the code, we remember what it's all about because we build a concept network. 
Now we have to understand the code. Understanding means a lot of thinking because the, it can be mind-bogglingly complicated. So now we start thinking about the code. And that is what we aimed for from the very beginning. Splendid, isn't it? Uh, now, so why is functional programming better? So my theory is, shucks, I'll, I'll show you something about theories. Um, this is a short story about a driver that goes to a garage. And he said that it's coughs and stops. My theory is that the seal got stuck. And the mechanic is seemingly outraged. He says, you call this a theory? Theory is a collection of axioms, rules of inference, and theorems derived from them. Theory is a system, not some stupid guesswork. And later on, he keeps writing. He thinks he's so smart, why he cannot tell theory from hypothesis. So my hypo hypothesis would be uh, that um, the functional programming is better aligned with the way our brain is structured. And that's why it's easier to understand and easier to reason about, easier to work with. Uh, sadly, this is all meta research. I, mean, I, I, done, I did a lot of reading, and there are conclusions I derived from it. Uh, but there was no experiment that we, that we provide with us with a hard proof that it really is the case. Could we experiment like this? Possibly. There are a few ideas being tossed around. I've been talking to some psychologists and we are considering some ways to, to find a proof for it. Uh, it's not easy because which language is most readable for, for you? It's the one that you know best, right? It's, it's as simple as that. So asking each of you to read code in a certain language will, will give us no, no good answer. Uh, we can make people read and analyze code in the language of, its, of, of his choice and see how they perform and do they get stressed out or not. Uh, but it's also tricky. Uh, there is another idea. Maybe we can turn something that is written in natural language to something functionalish and see if it's more, more understandable. For example, this is the beginning of a cooking recipe. It's purely imperative because the style of recipes are written it. And I don't know about you, but for me it's horrible. I mean, I, for, I cannot read this. It takes me like a quarter of an hour to figure out what I should really begin with, what it's all about. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I'm a coder. Maybe not. This would have to be checked. Maybe if you write it like this, so that you know what you, what you, what you have to start with, and then it's split out in subtasks, and you know how to do them, and it tells you the relations between them, for me it would be more readable. I don't know about average pe person. This is something that will have to be checked. Uh, and there's another research that would be very interested, interesting, uh, which means answering a question, why are you here? Not, I mean, not only Lambda days, but also uh, functional programming in general. Is it by accident, or, or is it because you have some personality trait that makes you prefer this over something else? Uh, it's also tricky because it's, um, it would need uh, comparative research. So we we'll have to make some questionnaires or in-depth interviews with you guys and with somebody on some Java conference or whatever. Uh, we'll see. Uh, if, um, if there is an interest in, in the outcome of such research, and if I can get some funding, and if I can get some psychologists to cooperate, then I hope maybe I'll be back next year with some results of it. And that's about it. We are already over time. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>